Beneath the memorial bridge on the floor of the Piscataqua River is a turbine powered by the incoming and outgoing tides. That power, provided by the mighty Piscataqua, generates electricity, which runs, among other things, monitoring equipment and lighting for the bridge. But let's go back, way back, Tides have been providing power for centuries, including the mills that were in Kittery from approximately 1694, when this part of the world was ruled by King William III. Before America was America, when this coastline was part of Massachusetts, governed by Lord William Pepperell. Before an industrial nation replaced a farming nation. These mills served many purposes. Today, we see what remains, but often don't recognize them or understand how significant they were to moving a fledgling nation forward. But what were tide mills, and how did they work? For most of human history, there were only two forms of mechanical energy available, people's muscles and animals' muscles. Several thousand years ago, people harnessed the power of moving air and moving water to transfer those natural powers for use in grinding grain or sawing stone. Mills on streams depended on rain but ocean tides were more dependable and they were more powerful. Thus, tide mills, which have probably been around since Roman times, came into being. Through the years, there may have been as many as 10,000 stream and river mills in Europe and America. Maybe only a thousand or so Tide mills, however. The Tide Mill Institute, a Maine-based research and educational institution, has been studying tide mills for nearly two decades, and we've documented more than 200 of them in Maine alone. Early American tide mills displayed the ingenuity of settlers who brought the technology from Europe in their heads and hearts. How do tide mills work? It's really simple. At an inlet or estuary, a dam would have been constructed to capture the incoming tide. A gate opened to admit it. When the area behind the dam filled and the tide began to ebb, it closed the gate. The tide lowered outside below the level of the trapped water. And then water from the higher level would be fed through a sluiceway and aimed at a wheel or a turbine. And the falling water turned the wheel. And in the mill, that tremendous mechanical energy was transferred to a saw blade or a grinding stone, or a trip hammer. And the tide mill was doing its work, grinding grain, sawing lumber, or pounding, just like mills on streams or rivers. Steam eventually took over these jobs, and tide mills became a thing of the past. This film shows some early tide mills of Kittery, Maine, and how members of Tide Mill Institute have been studying them. Enjoy it. Down this path is a true gem, unknown to most people, yet a clue is found in front of us every time we pass the street sign. This is the Thompson Tide Mill Dam and Pond, Little is known of the early history of this site, 
but evidence indicates the mill was built around 1694. The earthen and rock dam is approximately 75 feet in length. In addition to the pond and the dam, there is an eight and a half acres of wooden upland. This is a portion of the original 1694 parcel that still remains as part of the mill property. The current house adjacent to the pond is said to be built on the original stone foundation of the miller's house, but perhaps it was a barn or another outbuilding. The earliest mention of a mill at this site is contained in a December 16, 1693 deed from Richard Cutt to his brother-in-law Richard Breyer. In that deed, Cutt grants Breyer, and I quote, title and all water rights to Long Creek in at the mouth of Broad Cove. This included the right to dam over the said creek in any part thereof for the erecting of a corn mill, a sawmill, or fulling mill, and also to open or scour any run of water that may be brought into said creek. In his 1903 book, Old Kittery and Her Families, author Everett Stackpole shared his knowledge and observations of the mill dam and its neighborhood as follows. The remains of the dam built here are very noticeable. It was made of large stones, blasted and transported hither with much labor and expense. The dam was wide enough for a carriage road upon it. About the middle of it was the site of the mill. Remarkably, the millstones are still here. And if you look, you can still find remnants of timbers in what appears to be an outline of the foundation. Near the millstones, there is a line of medium-sized stones that stretch about 15 feet. When sided down, they form a straight line. There also remains of roughly nine inch wood piling. The dam itself was constructed on top of what appears to be mostly ledge. Onto the ledge, two parallel rows of large stone walls were built and lined with vertical wooden sheathing and mud sills. The area between the walls was then filled with smaller rocks, rubble, and mud. Small sections of the wood sheathing are still visible. Everett Stockpole goes on to say, The millstone of red granite still seen was probably brought from across the Atlantic. There is no stone like it in Kittery. On both sides of Long Creek, cellars indicate that large houses once stood, and on the hill to the west, probably, Richard Breyer lived. According to Stackpole, this area was the general vicinity of a once thriving community of houses, a brickyard, blacksmith shop, and shipyard. Back in 1903, it was all gone except for the cellar holes, and today even they are no longer visible. In the 1904 book, Reverend William Screven and the Baptists of Kittery, author Henry S. Barrage writes, One side of Mr. Screven's lot was bounded by what is now known as Broad Cove, and on the opposite side of the cove there was formerly a tide mill. This mill... I am told, was abandoned about 90 years ago, but the millstones remain, and they are almost the only relics of early Kittery enterprise on the west side of Spruce Creek. Now, if correct, this would place the abandonment of the mill at about the same time as the War of 1812, a time of extreme economic hardship for this area. A detailed British map published in the 1770s shows the area of the mill pond and Long Creek, but no dam. A 1795 town of Kittery map from a survey that was required by the General Court of Massachusetts does show the dam and it is marked mill. Knowledge of who owned the mill site in the years after Breyer acquired it in 1693 is currently incomplete. We do know that at some point it was acquired by the Rogers family who were landowners in the vicinity as far back as 1677. In 1958, Richard Rogers sold the property to Norman and Marion Thompson who, 
in 1991 in order to protect the property granted a conservation easement to the Kittery Land Trust. It's amazing that after more than 325 years, the millstones remain. A story is told that during the 1960s, a lobsterman took the bedstone for use as a mooring anchor. There was such a neighborhood outcry that it was promptly returned. Well, I'm sitting on a millstone that maybe belonged to one of the oldest uh, and maybe the first and maybe the last to operate mills in Kittery. We're on Chauncey Creek here and we know this is a Chapernone mill. The Tide Mill Dam was petitioned by William Pepperell in 1704 to the town and he wanted to get away to grind grain it wasn't such a long walk or such a long trip for him uh, out of town. So 1705, the town did allow that. And the town said to him, the inhabitants of the town of Kittery are very much strained for want of a gristmill in the town, being necessitated to go sometimes eight miles with their corn to grind and sometimes lose their bags and corn too. So... In order for them not to lose their bags and corn, William Pepperell built a dam on this site. And for a while, it was the only way to get to Elliot's Island or Chaperone's Island, or now known as Garish Island. It was the only way by land to get there until in 1736, they built a, a bridge to get over to Garish Island. It's in the same location as the bridge that's there now. So. We have that evidence of the grist mill being here. We have the traces of the dam, including some timbers uh, and some bricks. And the dam is there for everybody to see. When I first looked at that, before I was very involved in Tide Mill, I said, that doesn't look like a natural structure. And after I got involved in the Tide Mill Institute, I realized this is a dam. This is a Tide Mill dam to capture water and to grind grain. So it was here and built in 1708. And we also have a recollection from 1900 from B.R. Frisbee, who published it in the paper, from when he was a kid. And he said, as a boy, I often went to this grist mill with my grist and waited for it to be ground. Meanwhile, I would watch the miller about his duties and gaze at the machinery, which seemed so wonderful to me then. I can see it all now most vividly in my mind's eye. So we have the evidence of the town meeting, the permission of, uh, of the town gave to Pepperell, and we also have it on a map from 1794, the, uh, the state of Massachusetts, which we were part of in 1794, did a map of every town, and the map that we have seen is, has four or five, including what used to be Kittery and Elliott, uh, tide mills, and this is one of them. Not only do we have that dam that everybody can see, we also have the millstones. And these are grist millstones for grinding grain. This dam will probably be here for a long time, so I hope everybody gets to take a look at it. About a mile from here, up near uh, Chauncey Creek Lobster Pound, there's also remnants of a mill and all we know about that one is it's probably built after 1794 because it's not on that map uh, produced by the state of Massachusetts. And it was in the recollection of B.R. Frisbee in 1900 that it was the falls, the upper falls in Chauncey Creek and that it was wiped away by a storm. We don't know when, but we do know that we can see it and you can see it in the photography that we've taken. 
So that's about all we know about that mill. Long before the parking lots and shopping outlets of Route 1, there were two tide mills on Upper Spruce Creek. We don't think they existed at the same time. According to our invaluable Old Kittery and Her Families by Everett Stackpole, Withers erected a sawmill earlier than 1681. Then James Johnson bought 10 acres also. One quarter of the sawmill and corn mill nearby. The deeds show that Withersbury's mother willed the land to her cousin, Nicholas Shapley. In 1762, John Shapley sold land there to Richard Keating, founded by my three quarter of the mill and adjoining dam. This is also mentioned as the grist mill that stands on the creek where the old sawmill stood. The Stackpole map, traced from a 1762 map, shows only one grist mill in the same location. Also on the map of 1794, ordered by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts of every town, shows the grist mill in the same location. Then there are the published memories of B.R. Frisbee from the early 1900s. There was a mill at the head of Spruce Creek that was in operation in the 50s as a sawmill. Shipbuilding was carried on nearby during the 40s by John Davis. He built the schooner Jerome which was the largest schooner ever built at that period on the Piscataqua. So we look at the location near the present day Route 1, and there's clearly evidence of a mill dam to the east of it. And this is shown on two 18th century maps. West of Route 1, near the trading post dock, we see on both sides of the creek cut granite. This location is also documented in land deeds and memories. The northernmost mill site on Spruce Creek the one by the Kittery Trading Post is referenced by the early history of the Wilson family, published in 1898. Here's what they wrote. A stream runs under this road, the road to Elliot. This finally empties into the head of the west branch of Spruce Creek. It is now very small, but in early times was quite important. It is the chief outlet to swamps which were once very extensive. The swamps were mostly in one place and were called Putting Hole Commons, being common lands of Kittery. Out of this swamp, the stream runs nearly south for 150 rods or more until it reaches what was once a mill dam, near which stood a mill. This mill was in active use as a grist mill and bark mill as late as the early part of this century. The dam was first built and owned by Joseph Curtis, who used the water power chiefly to operate a sawmill. So if we measure north from Shapley's Mill, which is south of me here, 150 rods times 16 and a half feet per rod, we come up with 2,475 feet, which is about half a mile, which brings us here to where Spruce Creek crosses under the present day Picot Road. And north of us here on Spruce Creek would have been the Pudding Hole Commons. Behind me is Tucker's Cove. There are historic documents that show that in the southern part of Spruce Creek, there were three tide mills and clear remnants of one tide mill dam. Joseph Wilson, son of Gowan Wilson, one of the earliest Kittery residents, was at one time part owner of all of these mills. An inventory taken after the death of Joseph Wilson in 1710 credits him with 186 acres of land. 
Besides these holdings, he owned quite extensively in a sawmill that included half a large mill in partnership with Elihu Gunnison Jr. and Andrew Haley. He was also an owner in two other mills. One was on Goose Creek, a tributary of Spruce Creek. The other was north of Crockett's Neck at a place called Mill Dam. We can see the Goose Creek Mill in a traced map from Everett Stackpole. Today we don't see any physical evidence of this mill or dam. And even Stackpole in 1903 states, It is the only place on the east side of Spruce Creek, which shows beyond question that a mill once stood there. However, in a 1712 deed, there is mention of Elihu Gunnison's building yard, so ships may have been constructed here. Stackpole next says, The other sawmill was probably located north of Crockett's Neck at a place called today the Mill Dam. It is the only place on the east side of Spruce Creek, which shows beyond question that a mill once stood there. At Tucker's Cove, we can see two sets of stavings that enclosed the dam and even a marked timber that may have been part of the mill sluiceway. The third mill on eastern Spruce Creek appears to be near the present bridge to Crockett's Neck. The Wilson family history of 1898 called it Crockett's Back Creek. This is evidently the same that is known today as Barter's Creek. There is no physical evidence of a mill there. We have seen from the Kittery tax records there is a classification of taxable property, grist mills, filling mills, and sawmills. There is an intriguing entry for widow Mary Wilson's son Sam for eight shares of a mill. Which mill is being taxed? That's still a mystery. This is the Perkins Tide Mill site in Kennebunkport, just off of Mill Lane. And the lane, of course, was named for the mill. And this was an 18th century tidal grist mill uh, built for a family named Perkins. It remained a tidal grist mill for many years. And even in the early 20th century, it was run by a different grist miller named Perkins as well, who apparently was no relation to the first Perkins. But what happened was that at one point, uh, in its final years, it became the Grist Mill Restaurant. When I last saw both, uh, there was restaurant tables and chairs in both the old Grist Mill and in the grain warehouse. But all the equipment was there and intact, and it was original and old. You could see it. It had this ambiance of being 200 years old, and you felt like you'd walked into a barn that was just packed full of historical treasures, like an antique shop, and you didn't know what you'd find until you looked closer. And they had a they had these beautiful millstones in a wooden case. It had a, an old scale right next to it so the miller could weigh off how much, how much uh, grain he had ground and could package it properly. What happens in a grist mill is typically the corn comes in or a wheat comes in and the miller's job is to grind it first. And that first grinding it becomes what's called meal. And that's why you got cornmeal and oatmeal and things like that. So the meal is the uh, stuff that's been just run through the stones once. Now, if you want white flour, you've got to re-sift it and do some other things to the meal. And that's usually what happens in the upstairs of a grist mill, and tidal grist mills also. And this had a, an elevator, which was like a conveyor belt with lots of buckets that would pick up the meal and, up to it and drop it in some upper level bolters, which were just cylindrical sifters that would sift the, the meal and bring it out into different piles of, uh, you know, flour, middlings, and bran. So flour, middlings, and bran are produced from meal after it's been bolted. So that's typically what happens in a grist mill and what happened in this grist mill. And I remember one of the reasons that this had a neat little cupola on top was that was not only to get the view and the light, but it also helped shelter the top end of this grain elevator, which went all the way up to the top uh, cupola on, above the roof of the little grist mill. I always think about these little grist mills as 
they're a little deceptive. They look at first like a house on stilts or something really simple that a kid would understand like a dollhouse. But inside they had a complexity which rivaled a music box, you know, with, uh, with drums and things turning and gears and everything. And so there's this amazing complexity packed into these buildings and a simplicity on the outside. And being right on the water here, it's like a waterfront building. And back when the waters, the rivers were highways, it was like the people could come in by boat as well. And so... And if you've got free and available working water power here on a waterfront that's navigable, uh, you could develop other things at these sites too. And you frequently would find, you know, a, a tidal gristmill might also develop a tidal sawmill next to it, or it might decide to go into uh, grinding spices, like happened down at Slade Spice Tide Mill in Revere, Mass. Or it might want to grind paint pigments, and they could do that. Or it might want to produce baby carriages, like Tinkham's Tide Mill in Arlington, Mass. Um, so you get this high diversity of grist mills and sawmills and woodworking shops and paint mills and pigment mills and snuff mills and spice mills. You know, it's almost like somebody's planted a seed for innovation and then others come along and they plant other seeds inspired by it. And before long, you've got a really bustling center of innovation and commerce. And so these become little core, you know, growth areas of villages and business. And that's very typical and what makes them really special. When they first came here, how many pastures were there? Well, the answer is obviously none. Yet they brought cattle and they needed grazing land and they needed hay. So what was available? Salt marshes. So the first place to be settled was in proximity to the salt marshes here. This was a hub of activity. You had these farmers, and suddenly they needed access to this land. So they brought in shipping. And they tied up over here at two piers. But more importantly, the commerce that was taking place here on Garish Island, and at that time Champernow's Island, or Cuts Island, was in York. That was the center of all activity. Kittery was a fishing community. Kittery Point was a fishing community warehouses, but all the politics and so forth were primarily in York. So they wanted to go from Garish Island, Cuss Island, to York. So in 1649, they commissioned Thomas Crockett to construct a pier and put in a ferry at the mouth of Brayboat Harbor. So he had to cross the mouth of Brayboat Harbor, which at times can be extremely hazardous. That only lasted from 1649 to 1651, after which time only shipping came in here. And it came in here all the way up to Captain's Way, which is right behind me. The last man, the last person to utilize Captain's Way was John Thaxter. He's a descendant of the Thaxters from the Shoals. Celia Thaxter, Rosmond Thaxter are all Thaxters. John was in the mix of that family. And he lived on Cuts Island here. And he was shipping out produce during the summer, hay, firewood. And they were bringing in, in the turn of the late 1800s, early 1900s, they were bringing in ships here. And they were still training pilots to get in and out of Brayboat Harbor. A good source of historical information can be found in island and Harbor Echoes. This was a newspaper printed once a year by the graduating classes in and around Kittery Point. So you've got Harbor Echoes, which are the school, the Safford School, and then you had the one by where Pierce's gas station is. There was a school there known as Hutchins School, and school number 10 was on Garish Island. But as we got into the early 1900s, these schools consolidated into only the Safford School. 
So getting back over here, these captains were coming in here, and in those papers, in those annual um, synopses of of these meetings of this of the kids, they all got together on Thanksgiving evening every year and had a class reunion, and they wrote this paper. And there's so much great anecdotal information in there, and they talk about the training of the captains coming in here in the early 1900s. You wouldn't believe it, but you, all of a sudden now you've documented what we have behind us, these two piers that Thaxter used in 1900, 1910. And then suddenly Boston didn't need hay, produce, or firewood anymore. There were tractor trailers that were bringing everything in, so the tractor trailer of the 1800s, the schooner, became the tractor trailer that we know it today, transportation. So we had two piers out here, commercial, and one pier for the ferry from the tip of Garish Island here to Rain's Neck. How big were these schooners? Oh, a schooner would come in here, it'd be 60, 70, 80 feet, load up, two masted. They'd beach out right here, that's how they loaded. If it was lumber, they had port, they had a, at, the, at the bow, they had these ports they would open and they could load the lumber right into the hull, seal it, and just, just like what we have today for a ferry. They can open it up or drop it down, and drive on and off. Back then they just had a hole where they could slide the boards and stack them inside, then deck load them. This is one of the happiest days of my life that you are documenting things that I've been looking at for the last decade, decade and a half. Presenting conversations to people, uh, spurning no interest whatsoever. Crowds of 75 people, no one took an interest. But along comes Jim White and his crew. And suddenly now we're documenting the piers, the ferries, of what was here 250, 350 years ago. That's why the decay over that's over three and a half centuries, it's amazing you still have some timbers lying in the bank. Of course, they knew how to build things back then. There was no planned obsolescence. Today we build a chimney and it disappears in 50 years. You go to Fort McClary 220 years later and the mortar's just as good as the day they put it in. Jim, I want to thank you for documenting this, I think, very important piece of history that's virtually lost, except for a few uh, scraps of wood and a couple of stones here and there. But the Tide Mill Institute should also be thanked. I think their effort uh, should be appreciated too.